Let's get started. Take it to the cross, part six. Part six. Tonight, we are going to get into steps nine, 10, and 11 of take it to the cross. Now, we've gone through the first couple of steps, and by the time you get to this part in the cross, we're talking about a very spiritual, physical, emotional time here. The emotions are wrapped up. The physical um, body is, is included in this journey here. Mentally, spiritually, every part of us. And sometimes I think we compartmentalize our lives and we just get so spiritual that we forget that we are natural and we experience feelings. We experience stuff in our physical bodies. This is the whole journey that's going to the cross with us tonight. So by the time you get to this point, and we talked about this baggage that we're bringing up because the journey of the cross, Jesus Christ died to accomplish all the inheritance of the cross. We talked about the heaviness, the trials of life, the betrayals, the fears, denial, Peter. We're talking about our frailties. We're talking about our mistakes. We're talking about people we harmed, people that harmed us. We're talking about things that affect us in a sinful fallen world that hinder us, that hinder us in our walk from Christ. What is this whole baggage thing all about? What is having problems in your marriage all about? What is a financial um, collapse all about? What is sickness and disease all about? What is it all about when the enemy tries to come against your family, your kids, your finances, whatever the case may be? What is heaviness all about? The purpose of that is to steal your faith, to bring heaviness for you to walk away from Christ, saying that God doesn't work. God doesn't work. God didn't answer my prayer. He didn't show up for me. Because we need to learn as Christians to stand on the truth of the word of God that life is hard here. And being a Christian is not easy. Not being a Christian is not easy. We live in a sinful fallen world. The sinful fallen world still affects us. Those of us who are in Christ are redeemed from the curse of sickness and disease. We are redeemed from the curse of death. We are redeemed from sin. The sinful nature is conquered. Praise God. Hallelujah. But the problem is many people today don't understand that we are still affected by the flesh. The 100% fulfillment of the cross of Jesus Christ, the work is done. It is finished. It's already accomplished. Our healing is there. The sinful nature is conquered, but the 100% um, experience of that is going to come one or two ways. Either when Jesus Christ returns or when a Christian dies and crosses over because a Christian will never die. We have eternal life. Sickness and disease will affect us here on this earth. Does Jesus heal? He absolutely does. But this body has to die. This body is mortal. It is not immortal. So we all have to die from something. We talked about last week how sickness and disease will get into our body and sometimes Christians will pass away from a sickness or an illness or a disease. And we talked about faith. Is our faith contaminated? Is something wrong? Because people are preaching that nowadays, that something's wrong with people when that happens. And that's wrong. That's wrong. The sinful nature is conquered, but we still sin. We're saved by grace through faith, but sin still affects us. The natural world affects us. This is a natural, sinful, fallen body. This isn't it. So when we preach a gospel where we think we can have everything here on earth, where everything is going to be easy, what is the purpose of that? It's false teaching, and it teaches us that we don't have enduring faith if we're teaching that. Does Jesus Christ heal? He absolutely does. Yes, he does. And every healing that manifests here on earth in the earthly body is done through the spiritual miracle of Jesus Christ and the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. But what if we don't get that healing here? And you're a Christian. Are you still healed? Absolutely. Yes, you are. Why? Because when you cross over, it may manifest in heaven. It may manifest when you come across to the other side. Do we understand that? Does that make sense? Now it makes sense why 
people can die young, why people can die in a car crash, why, why a Christian can die from sickness and disease. Listen, sickness and disease doesn't have the Christian. This is the mortal body, not the immortal body. We get a new body when we die and when we cross over. That is the body that is no longer affected by the natural. It's no longer affected by the sinful fallen world. Do we understand the difference? We are so affected here emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally. We're affected here. The only part of us, the hope of glory who lives within us, praise God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God lives in us, the hope of glory. This is why we should be excited about eternal things. This is why we should be excited about heaven. That's why Jesus tells us not to get comfortable here on earth, because we're going to struggle here. It's going to be hard here. So the Christian says, well, you know what? I know how to endure because of the word. I know how to endure because I have a hope that's greater than this earth. I know that one day my suffering has a time limit. I know that one day sickness, sorrow, disease is going to be over. That's why we rejoice. That's why we rejoice. And when we don't get what we want, like Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he's talking about his eyesight, he has a physical ailment, right? He, has a, he does. Let me just tell you, he does. <laughs> right? Paul's been stoned and beaten and all kinds of stuff. So they think from a reference in Galatians 5, from, a, from when he was stoned or something, he can't see. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, pleads with the Lord three times, take this from me, heal me from this. He doesn't. Now, if anyone has faith, if anyone knows the Lord, if anyone has lost it all and given it all, it's, it's Paul, don't you think? What, is, what does Jesus say? My grace, it, my grace is sufficient enough. My grace is sufficient enough. And it's in red lettering, so please check. But see, we stop there. You know how I don't like to stop there. Why? Because Paul goes on to boast in his infirmities. He goes on to glorify God, even though he didn't get the physical healing because he knows, Lord, I know I do have my sight. I'm just going to have to wait for it. And I'm going to glorify you. See, this isn't the favorite gospel that we hear on TV and stuff like that. He knows that the hope of glory in Christ that he lives with and, and that he knows that one day, this is going to be over for him. This is going to be over for him. We're on step 9, 10, and 11. In 9, Jesus is nailed to the cross. We're going to preach about these all together. 9, Jesus is nailed to the cross. 10, Jesus hangs on the cross. And 11, forgiveness. We're going to talk about that tonight. Forgiveness. What that is and why that messes us up. Because by the time you get to this part of carrying your stuff to the cross, carrying the weight of the cross... Many of us want to turn back. When you're this close to your breakthrough, when you're this close to your breakthrough, you're getting tired. You're tired in the marriage. You're tired in everyday life. You're tired of, of running this race, and you're tired of carrying this weight. One of two things happens. People are tired because they're carrying this weight, and they're not trying to get well. They won't surrender because Jesus gave us the authority who lives in us. Jesus doesn't heal the marriage. He heals the people in the marriage. Those who surrender to him and who live according to his word. Because he gives us the authority. He gives us the word. He gives us the working power. And he expects us to live it out. He expects us to die to self every day. He expects us, like the Bible says, to throw off our sin. Amen? Amen. So it's our responsibility. So Jesus doesn't heal the marriage. He heals the people. Problem is not marriage. <laughs> the problem is the people within the marriage, right? Who can't get along or who are having a hard time. And it's a difficult thing. Amen? Amen. But that just means we need to surrender and get it together. We need to die to self. Whatever, whatever is in this baggage right here that we're taking to the cross, denial, betrayals, resentments, unforgiveness, all of this, 
He conquered it for us to be able to be strong enough to live here on this earth to fulfill our purpose, which is for Christ to be known and for others to know him through us. That's our purpose here. We're here to do the Lord's work. We're not supposed to get comfortable here. This is not our home. We're just passing through. So your paycheck is unto the Lord. Praise God. Because he paid it all so we can have all later. Amen. Amen. So we get to this part. Let's go to Matthew 27 and 35. Please, Matthew 27, verse 35. And I'm reading out of the, uh, New King James tonight. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Okay, now, why is this so important? Why do we care about them casting lots for his clothes? Prophecy. Let me talk to you about prophecy for just a minute. Because many people, when I first came to Christ, I was in the program of recovery because I was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I had a hard time believing in God. I had my own idea of who God was and my own idea of who God wasn't. And frankly, I didn't want anything to do with God. I was basing it on my own experiences, my own opinion, what I thought about God. I had no idea what this word said. Nothing. I based it on what I thought. The horrible things. If this is such a great God, then why do horrible things happen to people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Because we live in a sinful, fallen world. That's why. And there's a longer explanation. Prophecy is so important because it's one way, it's a major way that the Bible proves itself true. The Bible proves itself true. Now, we're talking here about um, the soldiers casting lots for Jesus' clothing. In Psalm 22, verse 18, David in the Old Testament talks about that many, 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 many years before that. David talks about casting the lots. It's a fulfillment of prophe prophecy. Do you know that there's 400 years between of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament? 400. Can't kill Jesus. Can't kill the gospel. Can't kill the greatness. He is who he says he is. Amen. There's more prophecy within here, and then we're going to get on to some more preaching, but we got to be taught. We have to be taught. This is stuff you have to sit and let soak into your mind because it doesn't tickle the flesh. This penetrates the flesh. This is what gets into your heart and produces enduring faith. This isn't the woohoo kind of gospel right now that I'm preaching because we're teaching, amen? amen? We're learning. Praise God. This is what produces enduring faith. Jesus' legs were never broken. That's another prophecy that was fulfilled. We're not going to read the whole thing. We could teach on, I could teach on, we're going to teach on the cross the rest of our lives, amen? amen. There's no way. The richness of the word. So when Jesus, when they go back in the time on the Sabbath, they have, these guys have to die. Jesus is on the cross and there's two criminals next to him. They have to die. They have to get him off the cross. It's the Sabbath. They can't leave him hanging. So what they do is they go and they break the legs. And if the legs are broken, they'll, they'll fall down and they'll suffocate. They'll suffocate. Well, they went to the first criminal, they broke his legs. Went to the second criminal, broke his legs. Came to Jesus, legs weren't broken. He was already dead, he was already gone. Now that was prophesied throughout the Bible many, many years ago. And there's so many of those different prophecies within the word of God. Why is it important for prophecy? Prophecy is very good for people who are very intellectual and they try to figure things out. Your atheists, for example, if they do the timeline of the Bible, there's just no way many of them who truly seek to prove Jesus wrong come to the Lord, they get saved. Amen. They get saved because it'll blow your mind. Amen? It'll blow your mind. Now let's preach a little bit. The part I skipped over was the forgiveness, and that's what I really want to focus on tonight. Luke is the only gospel that says the famous line, forgive them for they know not what they do, right? They crucify him and Jesus says, forgive them for they know not what they do. So not only is he teaching us that our sins are forgiven, he's teaching us how to forgive. This is where many people fall off. This is where many people say, uh-uh, 
no, 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 no. I'll sacrifice, I'll move on, I'll follow you, Jesus, I'll serve, I'll go to church, I'll pray, but I'm not forgiving him, I'm not forgiving her. You, can, you don't know what I've gone through, you don't know what's happened to me, you don't know what they've done to me. Jesus says, yes, I do. Notice that he says it at the end, mm, right before he dies. Now what's happened to Jesus? He's hanging on a cross, hello. He's hanging on a cross. These guys just laid him down. Okay, right? Can we get this picture in our mind? He's been betrayed by everyone. He's, he's been denied. He's been scourged, his skin torn off, crown of thorns in his head, dies a horrible, horrific death. Nobody there. Trial, he's totally innocent. Talk about a bag full of stuff. And what does Jesus say? Forgive them. For they know not what they do. Jesus is giving us the example that regardless of what somebody does to you, you forgive them. What does the word say? It says you forgive them immediately. Have you ever thought about that one? Like really, God? Have you ever thought about that? Some of this is going to be recap for some of you because we're never going to stop preaching this either. Have you ever thought about that? Like really right now, quickly? And then have you ever thought about that scripture that says if you don't forgive others that he won't forgive you? Amen. That's pretty scary, right? <clears throat> so that means we need to do it right now. He even tells us, you know what? Keep your money. Don't even bring an offering to me unless you go square it with your brother, whoever, the offense. Amen. Right? My program people who are in recovery, what's the worst thing we can cop? Huh. An offense, a resentment that's held in from unforgiveness, and we're trying to walk out steps eight and nine and a couple of the other steps in there. You know where it tells us where we make this list of who, who harmed us and who we've harmed, and we have to go to them and make amends. We have to make it right. Well, what if they don't want to make it right? Now what's your hope? What if you've done some things in your life where you can't make it right in your own mind? Where's the hope? Who can make it right? He made it right on the cross. He made it right on the cross. But see, this is the revelation Christ that the Holy Spirit gave to me a long time back. When you think about the word forgiveness, you need to think about this word, release. Release. That's it. Forgiveness, believe it or not, is the easy part. Forgiving someone, we write books how we're working on forgiveness and, you know, I'm just not there yet. I know the Bible says we got to do it. I'm just not there yet. I just, I can't. Can't do it. I'm not there yet. Well, Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you if you were there because I already been there. I already been there, done it. You need to do it so you can set yourself free, let yourself off the hook. Why? Because we're trained when we're little to say, if something goes wrong, two little people... And what do we tell our, our kids to do? And what are we trained as kids to do? We train them to go, just, you know what? Go tell them it's okay. Go, go tell them it's okay. So we start to relate forgiveness with telling that person what you did to me is okay. That's not true. That's not forgiveness at all. It's not okay. It's not okay. But what I am going to do is I'm going to release you and I'm going to release the offense and everything that goes along with it. I'm going to release it and I'm going to turn it into the hands of God and I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to embrace you, Lord. Because what happens, why does Jesus tell us to do it immediately? When we don't forgive, what is the whole purpose of the cross? What did he accomplish? What did he die to give us? Forgiveness. When you don't forgive people, you are denying your faith. You are denying the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Yep. You are denying Christ himself when you withhold forgiveness. When you withhold forgiveness, you withhold your healing. I put little sheets on your table. I want you to take them home with you. And just remember this little chart right here, which we're going to go through right now. Let's explain this. Let's explain this. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is not our work. It's the work of Jesus Christ. 
It is the work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So therefore, it's not our work. So therefore, we don't work on forgiveness. Forgiveness is never broken. Never ever have I heard anybody come up to me and say, you broke my forgiveness. Right? Because forgiveness is never broken because it's accomplished on the cross. And you can't undo what Christ has done. Forgiveness is not broken. You know what gets broken? Trust. So we're not struggling. We should never, ever struggle with unforgiveness. Never. We should never struggle with unforgiveness. Lord, I release you because what you want to do is release this thing and you want to turn to Christ and say, I accept the work of the cross of Christ. I forgive that person. And I put that person in that thing into your hands and I put myself into your hands to be separated from the situation. I want the healing. I want the journey. I want you to make me new on the inside. When you withhold forgiveness, you are turning your back on the work of Christ. Your healing, your new place, your restoration is on this side. I work with married couples all the time. 15, 16 years. <coughs> I have people come in and sit down and tell me, I'm st- I, you know what, I'm still working on forgiving him. That's why you're not well. You can't, go, you can't go any further, and people are trying to rebuild trust, and they're trying to heal while they're denying Christ. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Trust gets broken. Trust gets broken. Look here on your chart. It's not our work, but the work of Jesus Christ. It's developed and displayed through our integrity, character, and ability. Forgiveness is immediate. It's never broken. And it never needs to be rebuilt. It never needs to be worked on. It never needs to be rebuilt. Trust gets broken. Trust takes time to become trustworthy, to trust others, and to rebuild. The thing we struggle with is trust. Trust within ourselves and trust within others. And when we struggle with trust deeply within ourselves and struggle with trust deeply within others, guess who we struggle trusting to? God. We have a hard time trusting God. Because these things, this unforgiveness, and these things get in the way. These things get in the way. Forgiveness is a spiritual command. We do not get to choose who we forgive. We forgive everybody, we forgive them immediately, and we forgive them as many times as they offend us. That's what the Word says. Because it's not our work. We don't work on forgiveness. Now watch this. Trust. Trust is optional. Trust is optional. We choose who to trust, and we must choose wisely. The Bible says guard your heart. Bible says guard your heart and many, many other things about trust. What we do in society today many times is we're online, hooking up here, doing this. We fall for attraction, which becomes a distraction. And many times we just lay our heart out there. We don't guard our heart. We dive right into something and we get hurt and then we withhold forgiveness. We do it backwards. We do it backwards, right? You hurt me. I'm, I'll love you, but I'm going to love you on my terms. Because I know I need love because we're built to love. But listen, I'm going to tell you how this is going to go. Amen? That was how Pastor Daryl and I, that's how I, I came together with him, being a single mom with three kids and suffering through other relationships. And I'm working and I'm paying my own bills and I'm doing my own thing. And you know what I told him? I said, listen, I love you, but I don't need you. So let's get one thing straight here. I'm going to love you the way I need to love you. I don't need you coming up in here, paying my bills and taking care of stuff. I'm doing just fine. Because this is what happens in relationships. I'm a single mom. I wear the pants in this family. I don't need you coming up here giving me nothing. Right? Attitude. (laughs) Pastor Daryl's like, okay. (laughs) So don't you want to love me? Remember some of the baggage we talked about that we bring into our marriages, right? The betrayals, right? That was one of mine. I was a very strong woman because I had unforgiveness. I had bitterness. And you know what? By the way, if you cheat or fall off like every other man I've had, you know, woo, here comes the violin, right? So when you hurt me like everyone else has hurt me, 
I can just dump you off at the corner because I'm going to be just fine because I know how to take care of myself. So these are the conditions of our love. Are you in? <laughs> right? Now listen, I'll throw myself out there. It's all right, but I'm sorry. What are your conditions? What are your conditions? This stuff ruins marriages. This stuff ruins the peace. It ruins the intimacy. It ruins us from the inside out. It, it infects us. We bring how we were raised into relationships. Our beliefs, things we were taught. You know, I'm never going to be my mom. I'm never going to be my dad. Yes, you will. Yeah, you will. That's why we have to journey to the cross. There's always a remnant of something in there, right? Always. It's got to go. Amen. Praise the Lord, it can. Hallelujah. Right? The hope of glory. Amen. Because he made the way. Amen. He made the way. Forgiveness is not proven. No one gets to prove to us that they are worthy of forgiveness. We've established that. But trust must be proven. It's proven over time. Consistency. When you're trying to come together, when there's been an offense and something has happened, it's okay to say this. It's okay to say this. It's okay to say, I forgive you because we're supposed to do it immediately. You know what? I forgive you, but I'm hurt. I don't trust you. That's the right way to, to get into this issue. I deal with married couples all the time. And I can't help them. I say, if you don't want to forgive, if you can't, and we go through this thing, and if you don't want to forgive, or people just walking through life and trying to get free from their past, this will hold you to your past, whether you're married or not. Whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're middle-aged, whatever the case, this will lock and load you into your past because you're denying Christ. He, listen, he doesn't barge in. He says, I did this work. I love you so much. I'm going to transform you from the inside out, but you need to release. You have to release. And until you do, this stuff's going to build up and it's going to infect everything that you get yourself into, right? Yeah. This is where people fall off. This is a big one. This is a big one because no one wants to be hurt. No one wants to be hurt. It is difficult to be with somebody or to live with somebody or to have to be in a situation. And maybe you're a young person living with parents. Maybe um, that's how you grew up or, or maybe that's relationships you've gotten into. Toxic, I'm talking about toxic, dysfunctional stuff. It turns into more toxicity, more toxic stuff, more dysfunction, unless it's dealt with, unless we examine what the heck is going on. This represents the inside of us. This, what, this is what happens from a sinful fallen world, and it produces defeat. It produces dysfunction. It produces dysfunction. Forgiveness is released, not accomplished. We don't accomplish it. Jesus Christ accomplished it. Trust is accomplished over time. Over time. Have you ever had someone come up to you and say, I'm sorry, and you do the exchange, and you say, okay, it's, it's okay, those famous words, and then you say, I forgive you, and then that person's like, oh, yay, yippee, skippy, everything should be just fine now. Why are you still mad at me? Well, I'm sorry, it's only been five hot minutes since the little I'm sorry thing. Can you give me, like, maybe five days? I don't know. I've only been tracking this with you for ten years. Can I have more than five minutes? Right? Have you ever been in that situation? Right? Because if we don't understand the difference between forgiveness and trust, people can't be rebuilt. They can't be restored. It's the biggest lie of the enemy, one of the greatest lies of the enemy, greatest deceits. He wants us bound. Why do you think there's 50 million books on forgiveness, how to forgive, how to do this, how to forgive that? But I think we have it all wrong. I think we have it all wrong. Jesus did the work of forgiveness. He did the work. We need to learn how to trust. There are no levels or relationships of forgiveness. Okay? We just forgive everybody. But there are different degrees, levels, and relationships of trust. They will not all be the same. So trust is your area where you get to play with that. You get your choices in that. 
And the Bible is very clear that we need to be very careful how we treat one another. Are we trustworthy? Are we trustworthy? People that have bad character, character defects that are with inside people, you, they're not trustworthy because it's a character issue. They can try all they want to. I can try, and these are the people who promise you, I'm not going to drink for two weeks. You know what? I'm never going to do that again. If you'll just take me back. It's, it's the promises. And many people really want to believe that. They really want to do that. But they're not doing the work on the inside, so therefore there's no outside change. You can hang out there for a minute. You can probably accomplish it for a minute, but bad character is never going to act right. Bad character is never going to act right. And the cure for character defects is the character of Jesus Christ instilled within you through practical application, through prayer, and through obedience to his word done over and over and over again because that is trust. Consistency over time. Consistency over time. Consistency over time. So forgive me if you do it nice two or three different times or if I walk through something with you for many, many years and I start seeing signs of something come up and if I start to get a little edgy. That's the flesh, right? Get a little nervous, right? Because you're remembering how it used to be. Don't want to go back there. Trust is very serious. We don't take that serious in today's society. We just treat each other any old way. It's called selfishness. We hurt each other. Forgiveness is a step, it's not a journey. Must be released before healing can take place and the trust we rebuilt. Trust is a journey. Now here's an important one. The cycle of sin must stop before healing and trust can begin within a relationship. Now if you're in a relationship and one person is not on board and you're on board, as soon as you say, Lord, forgive me, you are in the healing pattern. But your relationship can't heal until the cycle of sin stops. Do we understand that? The person who is in the cycle of sin has to stop it because trust can never be broken if the cycle of sin continues. If they're having an affair, the affair has to stop. That means I'm living in the same house, but we're living separate. There's division because what does sin do? It divides. Amen? Amen. It's what it does. Cycle of sin has to stop. Maybe it's a cycle of coldness. Maybe it's a cycle of spending. Maybe it's a cycle of worry. And what happens with these cycles of sin is the person gets self-centered and self-focused and they hurt everyone else around them. They're not aware. They're no longer aware. It's all about them. Cycle of sin has to stop before trust can be rebuilt. But the beauty of Christ, as soon as you surrender to him and as soon as you come to, come to him, regardless of the situation, regardless of the relationship, you can start healing. You can start rebuilding yourself. You can start getting strengthened. You can put one foot in front of the next, and God's going to lead you and guide you and take care of you. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Forgiveness is the operational system of cleansing and purifying the heart. That's a big one, because to create in me a clean heart. David said, against you and you alone I have sinned, Lord. So we sin against God, but the consequences come against each other. The product of sin comes against one another. That's why it's so hurtful and so harmful. Trust is the foundational block of relationships. Relationships are built on trust or torn down when trust is broken. And when we can't forgive, and when we can't put boundaries, and when two people, a relationship takes two, when two people can't get on the same page and begin operating within the same things, that's why we have this constant like this. What would it be like if we did what the Word said? Think about this for a minute. What if we went home? And if you're single, what if you went home and you just said, God, forgive me, and I forgive everyone who's ever harmed me. I release them. And you started putting this into practice. And what if you said, I forgive myself. I forgive my parents. I forgive every bad relationship. I forgive every person that's ever harmed me. I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. And by the way, God, forgive me for all those I have harmed. Now think about this if you're married. What if you went home and you're in your home and you look at each other in the eyes and you hold each other's hands and you say, I forgive you. 
and the spouse says, I forgive you. Now let's start on the journey of healing and be obedient to his word. And let's start right now just receiving Christ and receiving the work on the cross and following his lead. We know it's going to take time. We know it has to be built. We know it's going to be rebuilt. But you know what? Let's agree that we're both in the boat. What would happen? That's powerful. That's powerful. Some stuff would begin to happen. The power of God would meet you right where you're at. Because what are you doing? I open myself up to the work of the cross. Nothing can stop the Holy Spirit. Nothing can stop the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Nothing can stop him. Forgiveness is not our struggle, battle, or issue. Trust becomes a battle, struggle, and issue when it's broken. So trust is the culprit, not forgiveness. Trust is the issue, not forgiveness. We think about stuff like that, abandonment, betrayals, broken hearts. Even if our bank account goes down, we got fired from a job, trust gets broken, and it needs to be rebuilt over and over and over again. So the cleansing of the heart, that's a constant thing, taking ourselves to the cross, accepting the work of Christ. As a Christian, our greatest profession of faith is Christ and Christ crucified, the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of new life. So when we go around and we say that we're a Christian, but we don't forgive, we're denying Christ. Think about that. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Last one. We're closing with this and we're done. Forgiving is an act of embracing your faith, receiving all that Jesus died to give you. It is the beginning of freedom. We just established that. Trust. And I put Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 on here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. We trust in the Lord with all of our heart because he will never hurt us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He will never lead us down the wrong, uh, wrong path. When we put our trust in him, we set ourselves up for success for when human relationships go wrong. We know where to go. We know why things go wrong. We know who to go that we have to trust into to get our answers. And he'll lead us to people here on earth to help us. Because remember, we talked about that last week. Help will show up. Help does arrive. It comes. He's going to send it, but we have to recognize it. And we have to receive it. And we have to receive it. So when you think about trusting the Lord, if you have bitterness, unforgiveness, anger in your heart, if you don't know the Lord, if you don't know this word, and if, and if we're just trying to create a God of our own understanding, we don't have to flounder. We have the true understanding of God right here in this word, and he's powerful. This gives us the true understanding of God. This is the word that changes a person's life. If you're trying to figure it out, forgiveness on your own, doing it in your own power, making it up as you go along, not going to make it. We're not going to make it. So when trust gets broken, we go to our creator. We have to be very aware of the power of unforgiveness and even greater the power of forgiveness. When we do forgive, we are un unlocking and unloading the baggage. We're taking it to the cross to get free in him, to get our families free, to get our kids free. And he'll meet you right where we're at. Some of us have done unthinkable things, crazy things. His grace is sufficient. The same grace that saved you is the same grace that will heal you. The same faith that saved you is the same faith that will heal you. When we call upon the name of the Lord and in the enduring times, if we have to wait for a healing or wait for an answer or wait for something, we put our faith and trust in Him and we reach out to Him. This message is kind of a heavy one. And it's one that we always need to think about and consider because when we don't deal with it, 
This produces many of our problems, many dysfunction that goes on today. This produces porn addiction. This produces alcoholism. This produces thoughts in people's minds, and you can open your eyes. This produces thoughts in people's minds where they don't matter. What is this life all about? What is this all about? Why am I here? People are looking for a release. People want to check out of reality. When things get heavy and people get burdened, they want to check out. You want to quit. And one of the things that we're going to talk about next week, because we're going to talk about it is finished. You know, when we were talking about they were casting lots for his clothing, but one thing they did before that happened, they mocked Jesus. They told him, save yourself. Take yourself down. If you're the king, you can save yourself. How many of you have ever thought that? There's an easier, softer way. I can save myself. This is too painful. I can't make it through. And man, it is almost finished and you turn back. You take yourself down off the cross. You relapse. You backslide. You find your way back. I can't take this restoration process. Why? Because it's painful. Boy, you're right there. You're right there. Hang on. Hang in. Keep going. Keep going. Because once you go back, you have to start all over again. Now, God will restore you right where you're at. But the more we stay out there, the longer we keep going back, the harder it is to return. The harder it is to come back because people get tired. People get tired in their marriages. They get tired in daily life. Boy, when we refresh ourselves in the Lord and we just obey him and we follow him and we just drop the load at his feet at the cross and say, you know what, God, I'm going to do my part and what I can't do, I'm going to allow you to do. That's when we start to get it. I got my eyes on heavenly things and I'm going to trust you to strengthen me with the authority in me to accomplish what I need to do here. It's our responsibility to live it out here, strengthened through him and led through him. Amen. Let's set ourselves up for success. Let's celebrate him that he accomplished this work on the cross and that one day it will be over, but he gives us the strength, the wisdom, the direction. He gives us so much. God, if we would just die to self and come to him. And when we refuse him, we continue on in a path of destruction and we build stuff up, build stuff up. And one day you wake up and how did I get here? How did this happen? Well, we just kind of went through how it happens. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's take this word home this week. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. Holidays are tough for some people because they struggle with this topic right here. That's one reason why I was hoping we were going to get to this before holidays because family members have to come together, you know, stepkids and, and these things and blended families, ones that don't blend so well and things of that nature. We kind of feel it at this time. It's kind of tough. So we need to release and let it go. So tonight, we're going to lighten the load. And we're going to close in prayer. And we're going to have some pie. And we're going to have some cakes. And we're going to have some fruit. And we're going to fellowship. And even though we may, may feel heavy now, we're going to lift ourselves up. And we are going to think about the freedom that we talked about. And not get caught up in the memory, but think about the freedom and how we embrace the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, praise you, and glorify you, Lord God, that you died, Father, to save our souls, to cleanse our souls, to restore us, Lord, that you made forgiveness possible. I pray over each and every one of us that we are aware of forgiveness, that we would embrace our faith, your work on the cross, Lord God, that we would just go home and stop working on it. Father, that we would surrender all to you, that we could start fresh, that we would start new tonight, this day, right now, in the midst of your word and your presence and your will. Father, we just say thank you. We just glorify you. We give you thanks and praise, Lord God, and we lift up the name of Jesus, Father. And as we go out today, Lord, we say thank you for the opportunity to fellowship now, Lord God, to make new friendships, Father God, and to lift up the name of Jesus. I pray peace, love, and joy over each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Let's fellowship.